So welcome back to the Eyewitness Gospel of John. And as you know, we have crossed over from John's broad treatment of the um, three years of Jesus' ministry. And we have now crossed over into John's in-depth treatment of Jesus' final week on earth. And the borderline between those two great movements is John chapter 12. And that's where we are for the last couple of weeks and the next couple of weeks as well. Now, just for a refresher, a very brief refresher, despite the fact that we are in the middle of the summertime, obviously, uh, last week we took a very close look at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which is also known as Palm Sunday in July, which is a rather strange part of it. But the bottom line of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was that it was an act of superlative courage. Because Jesus, you'll recall, was an outlaw. He was, uh, everyone was told in Jerusalem and surrounding country that if you saw Jesus, you had to report him immediately. So Jesus made it very easy on the Pharisees by riding into Jerusalem to great fanfare. So it was superlative courage when he came into Jerusalem. Also, it was an com- act of complete defiance against anything and everything that man could do to him. And thirdly, and most importantly, when he came into Jerusalem, it was an act of all-surpassing love. Because Jesus knew his hour had come. Jesus knew that he was coming into Jerusalem in order to do one thing. And that was to die for all sinners. To die for all lost, blind, hopeless sinners A wretch like me, I put that in quotation marks, but I take them away. A wretch like me, period. And he came to atone for sins, to save people from sins, to deliver people and make them new. All the hosanna shouting, all the palm branch waving, all the cries of long live the king were still ringing in Jesus' ear. And as well, they were grating still on the nerves of the Sanhedrin when, suddenly, some foreigners stepped forward. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. We don't know exactly what they wanted, these Greeks. But Jesus' answer is the subject of our message today. In this answer, first of all, he made it very clear that he was not going to be a political messiah or a political king. He was not going to be running for office, nor would he be making any social reforms or raising taxes. His intentions were entirely different. Jesus was going to bring, he indicates clearly, he was going to bring a spiritual kingdom. He was going to bring a spiritual revolution. Oh, there'd be reforms, all right. There'd be reforms. Reforms of the heart. For individual men and women, for blind, lost, hopeless wretches like me, whoever would turn to him, humbly, sincerely, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and never turn back. So he came for that purpose, but Israel was not interested. They wanted Rome's oppression to be broken. They wanted a political kingdom. They wanted a material kingdom. They wanted a worldwide kingdom, and they wanted it now. But Jesus offered no such thing. So four days later, they crucified him. But on that day of palm branch waving and entry into Jerusalem, they cried, Hosanna, which means save us now. They were hoping, hoping, hoping that Jesus would be their conquering hero, that he'd be their heavyweight champion, that he'd be their soldier of fortune. But that was not to be. And so Jesus rode bareback on that young donkey into Jerusalem. And as he did... It says in the text that Jesus wept. He wept because Israel had it so wrong. 
He wept because he would never be what they wanted him to be. He wept because not only would he not overthrow Rome, but by 70 AD, only 51 years later, Rome would overthrow Jerusalem. And Jesus knew it. And their hallowed temple would be destroyed. 100,000 Jews would be taken away as slaves. And get this, 1.1 million Jews in Jerusalem would lie slaughtered in heaps of bodies in 70 AD. But now, back to the visit of the foreigners. The Greeks arrive. Simple request. They say, we'd like to see Jesus. There it is. And Philip and Andrew go to Jesus, tell him about the request, and what does Jesus say? Is the sound up? Kapoto. What does Jesus say? This is what he says. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. The Greeks asked the question, we'd like to see Jesus. You know, if I was Philip and Andrew, I'd say, so is that a yes? We don't know. This passage ranks right up there, friends, for pure shock value. Especially for those who heard it for the first time. And those who are expecting him to say something very different. In fact, I don't know if you find those words shocking. I still find them shocking today. The only part that's expected is verse 23, where Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We get that part, and everyone could agree on that part, because he came into Jerusalem, the crowds were ecstatic, the coronation for him appeared to be right on track. But the rest of his answer, as you see in 24 to 26, seems to come straight out of left field. There's there's no talk there of conquest on this path to glory. Instead, what there is, is talk of sacrifice and surrender and suffering and servitude and death as the pathway to glory. The first answer in verse 24 is a mystery. The second answer in verse 25 is a paradox. The third answer in verse 26 is a conundrum. But let's just label all three answers as paradoxical. A paradox is a proposition that seems senseless, but when explained, is well-founded. Okay? A paradox is something that seems senseless, but when explained, is well-founded. Verse 24, 25, and 26 are all three paradoxes. How can we possibly understand what he meant in these verses? The first thing we must do is say, O Holy Spirit, help us to understand the hard sayings of our King." Help us understand these hard sayings, for they are the deepest and richest treasures that will surely enable you and I to live a fruitful Christian life. So Holy Spirit, open our minds and our hearts to understand and receive these three hard sayings now. The first paradox It is only by death that you can gain life. I tell you the truth. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. 
Now, nature itself tells us that a grain of wheat, a single grain of wheat, is ineffective and unfruitful as long as it is preserved in safety and security. You take that grain of wheat, you lock it away in an empty jar, and nothing happens. Take that grain of wheat, leave it on the granary floor, and nothing happens. Take the grain of wheat, mail it away in a letter to a friend, nothing happens. But when that same seed is thrown into the stone-cold ground and buried as if it was laid in a tomb, it will germinate, grow, bear fruit, and produce many seeds. This is true. Don't be surprised this is true. Jesus begins this little section with the words, Truly I say to you. Truly. Truly. When a follower of Jesus looks at his life, he will see how many times the greatest accomplishments, the greatest good, the greatest fruitfulness in their life has risen from the ashes of death, defeat, and despair. You thought all was lost. You thought the jig is up. You thought the game is over. But God had other ideas. He had greater things in mind for that single seed that died. And this, my friend, happens wherever Jesus is king. Wherever Christ is king, in whichever life Christ is king. If Christ becomes your king this very hour, if he becomes your king, this, what Jesus speaks of in verse 24, will begin to happen in your life. New life coming out of death, defeat, and despair. Your marriage may appear to be dead. Your future may appear to be dead. Your health may appear to be dead. Good. It is only dead on the surface. Lay it in the cold stone tomb next to Jesus Christ. Let what is dead touch Him. And He'll infuse it with resurrection power. God in His might, God in His providence, God in His grace will bring that dead thing back from the dead along with your own soul and begin to produce abundant fruit for His glory. As an 18-year-old, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was serving a little country church in rural England during the 1850s. And he was doing so as an 18-year-old with great zeal and even greater effectiveness. And his father kept encouraging him to attend college and attain a higher education. In order to be accepted into the program, prospective students were to be interviewed by the college principal and as an obedient son and as something that he was wrestling with himself Charles set up that interview with that principal and arrived on time and a servant girl answered the door and brought him into the waiting room where he waited and he waited for two hours with no sign of the principal frustrated he got up and he left the room only to discover that the servant girl had in fact shown the principal into a different room on the opposite side of the building. The principal too had waited and waited and finally he left to catch a train and the interview never happened. So as young Charles Spurgeon walked home and he thought about what happened, he heard the voice of the Lord in his heart speaking a word of Scripture from Jeremiah the prophet. These words. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. 
Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. And immediately he felt this wave of peace wash over him. And he knew that he knew that he knew that in his case, despite the value of education, that he was God's minister already. That he would return to that little country church in the middle of nowhere to preach. And he would let the seed of career ambition and worldly praise and wider attention die in the ground. Well, within one year, by God's providence, the 19-year-old Charles Spurgeon was invited to London where he became the pastor of the largest Baptist church in the city. And within 10 years, 10 years, that church was the largest and most influential church in the entire world. And Spurgeon would later refer to that missed interview as the Lord's hand behind the maid's mistake. The Lord's hand behind the maid's mistake. Could the Lord's hand be behind your mistake? Your whole series of mistakes? Could the Lord's hand be behind your dying dream? Your fond hope, which now lies dashed in a thousand pieces? See, this is where I pray, may God help you understand and apply paradox number one. For neither you nor I can make it very far in life unless we wrestle through this hard saying that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. Unless we wrestle through that hard saying. But when we do, we'll find great comfort in that hard saying and blessing and we'll find new hope. See, our lives are human receptacles of pain. Pain from our past failures, our past losses, our past mistakes. But when you will see the invisible hand of God, it is this paradox that can heal us, that can make us whole and give us hope and purpose and a future again. It has for me, and I trust it has for you. For dying and then rising again, this is the Jesus way. And it was never more true than when Jesus came into Jerusalem to be arrested, scorned, crucified, and buried. A single seed, so that all those who might believe in Him would find life in Him. Many seeds. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You know, in some churches when you say that, that people say, thanks be to God, right? Right? They don't say amen. They say thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Second paradox. It is only by hating life that you can retain it. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The graphic on the screen represents the world. The world. I confess my mind recoils at the second paradox. But here's the deal. Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it. Done. I therefore discipline my mind to understand what he means. Not change what he means, not reject what he means, but to understand what he means. See, if I have a problem or if you have a problem with any verse in Scripture... From Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. If you or I have a problem with any of those verses, the problem is in you. It is not a problem in the Scripture. The key phrase 
in this paradox are the three words I've underlined in this world. To love your life in this world, that's the big mistake. To hate your life in this world, that's the ideal to pursue. And here's how we understand this. Four points. To love your life in this world means to live with only this life in view. To live with only this life in view. This life here on planet earth, it's all you think about. This life here in this bag of bones is all you focus on. This life here of money and things, it's the basis of all your decisions. Your primary questions include, how can I live my best life now? And if you think I'm echoing the title of a best-selling book, I am, and it's on purpose. Your primary questions include, what are my dopamine levels are at now? Referring to Brennan Park's excellent message from a couple weeks ago. How am I feeling now? Am I having fun yet? These are your primary questions. Questions about preparation for the life to come never enter your mind. For you love this life to the exclusion of eternal life. You fight for every advantage you can get in this life. And when things go well in this life, you are so high. And when things go poorly in this life, you are so low. Because the only thing that matters to you is this life. This life. It's the only thing in your perspective. That's what it means to love your life in this world. And it also means, I'm not sure why, but can you advance me one slide, please, Deborah? Thank you. To love your life in this world means to live for the very same things people in the world live for. They love cars and houses and boats and vacations. Me too. I love cars and boats and houses and vacations. They live for their appetites, their pleasures, their entertainment. Me too. I live for pleasures and appetites and entertainment. They live for money, sex, and power. Me too. I live for money, sex, and power. No discernible difference between your values, motives, and practices and the values, motives, and practices of someone who doesn't know Christ. And even a casual ob observer can see that you are just the same as them. And if that description rings true for you, Jesus says, you lose, man. You lose. In the Gospel of Luke, he told a parable where he said, not you lose, but he said, you fool. Tonight, your life is required of you. You're, you're living terribly short-sighted, and you are about to be bitterly, eternally disappointed. This second parable rubbed off on John so strong that he wrote this in his first letter. Next slide. Do not love the world, nor things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. To love your life in this world means to live with only this life in view, 
and to live for the very same things that people in the world live for. Let's look at the other side now with two more points. To hate your life in this world means to be dissatisfied with a material, secular, I would also add the word humanistic, approach. Material, secular, humanistic approach. To hate your life in the world means you're dissatisfied with that. Why are you dissatisfied with those approaches to life? Because you know there is so much more. You know that this life, this life, is nothing more than a cheap motel, a noisy hostel, a moral gymnasium where we get in shape for the world to come. We really don't need to milk this life for all it's worth. We really don't need to be overly concerned to taste all of the finery of this life because there's a much more splendid life yet to come with mansions, banqueting tables, streets of gold beyond description all prepared by the Savior of our souls. The material, secular, humanistic approach does not turn our crank. To put it bluntly and rather crassly and shockingly, we hate it. We hate it. Our eyes are fixed on unseen things. Our eyes are fixed on eternal things. Our eyes are fixed on Christ Jesus seated in the heavenly places. Because that's where the action is. And that's where we want to be. Second, fourth, depending how you count, to hate your life in this world means to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Jesus. For the follower of Jesus, every moment of every day, we do one thing. We repudiate and reject a self-centered worldly life. That is what we hate. What we love is Christ and what He's done for us. We believe in Him. We follow Him. We submit our every thought, word, and deed to Him. We love God. We love others. And we do so for His sake. We do it moment by moment, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Him. This is the second great paradox, the second hard saying. If we live by that, it will lead us to a fruitful life, a meaningful life, and a joyful life. It is only by hating life that you can retain it. Still no cigar. Number three. So something has come unplugged. That's my guess. Make sure that the little USB cord is plugged in on the right-hand side. Is it plugged in all the way? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that thing is hanging. Nope. We'll do our troubleshooting later. Number three, the third paradox. It's only by serving that greatness comes. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Here we find Jesus assuming that everyone who believes in Him, everyone who follows Him, will serve Him because they have a work to do. We don't work as you well know. We don't work in order to save ourselves. That's already been done by our King and our Redeemer. He's already finished the job to save our souls. That is by faith, not by works. But what is clear is that we were not saved by our Savior in order to sit around. We were not redeemed by our Redeemer to be idle. We weren't sanctified by our High Priest to do nothing. We weren't quickened by the Holy Spirit to be bored. We are servants 
and workers and imitators of Christ. Every woman here, every man here, whether able-bodied or not, and I spoke to a woman yesterday who is not able-bodied, who is in her home, on her bed all the time, and she phoned me, and she said, Pastor, what can I do for you? And she hasn't been off of her bed in ages. And she lives over here. It's Anne Schaap. What can I do for you, Pastor? I was humbled. But every person, able-bodied or not, should feel, I have a work to do for God. I met someone else two days ago who just recently retired, who can't shake the thought that I have a work to do for God. And she presented a few ideas to me. If you haven't thought that thought in the past, you should start thinking it now. Because it is true. Whoever serves me must follow me, and whoever follows me must serve. And that means to do what you can. Do whatever your hand finds to do. Don't talk about tomorrow or someday, but do it. Do it now. We joke about this at home. Three, two, one, do it. Do it. Do it now. Three, two, one, countdown. Get started. Make it urgent. Ask yourself, what can I do as a work for God before I go to sleep tonight? That urgent. What can I do before my head hits the pillow tonight? Is there somebody that I could visit this afternoon? Is there someone that I know who's going down the wrong road in their life and maybe, just maybe, I can influence them, I can lead them down the right way this afternoon? Don't just make it urgent. Make it high quality. Serve with all your might. If something is worth doing, it is worth doing well. For after all, who are you working for? Every single week, I aim to preach the best sermon I have ever preached because my king deserves it. Similarly, every teacher ought to teach their very best lesson they've ever taught. Every worship leader ought to put together their very best set they've ever put together. Every worker ought to reach to their highest level. Our king should never get second best because even our best truth be told, is too poor for him. The greatest people in the world, the ones who are fondly remembered for generations, are those who serve. The third paradox states that only by serving does greatness come. Now the world has it all wrong. The world thinks that if you live to serve others, you're immediately in danger of ineffectiveness, obscurity, and weakness. The Bible says, Jesus says, nonsense. Balderdash to that. If you live to serve Christ and serve others, starting with your wife and your children and your grandchildren, moving out in concentric circles to your friends, your neighbors, your employees, I assure you, greatness is not far behind. No, greatness is already there. And it was never more true than for Christ Himself, who arose each morning to serve His Father and serve everyone whom His Father would lead to Him. Christ's greatest act of service was His crucifixion. For the greatest good came from that greatest act of of service. Now, next slide. Back to the Greeks. It's where we began this morning. The Greeks who say, hey, we want to see Jesus. It does connect with verse 24, 25, 26. It wasn't a non- sequitur. People will see Jesus in you. They will? Yes, they will. When your kernel of wheat dies in the ground and new fruitfulness 
rises. They will see Jesus in you when you hate your life in this world because you're living for a better life. They will see Jesus when you serve Him and serve others. This is how they will see Jesus. This is how you will show Jesus to the world. I never saw that until this week. We want to see Jesus, okay? Follow me. Die with me. Hate your life in this world with me. Serve me. This is the word of the Lord. And let's be honest. This way is hard. It's hard to see that kernel of wheat die. It's hard to hate your life in this world when everybody else is whooping it up. It's hard to follow Jesus on a road that leads to the cross. And it's hard to take the role of a servant in a world that only understands power. But these things are what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Don't be confused by the lowest common denominator out there about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Forget those lowest common denominators. This is the truth of what it means to be his disciple, to follow him, to die with him, to hate your life in this world and serve him. Jesus said it would be hard. The gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. But the way is glorious. It's hard and it's glorious. It's more glorious than we can ever imagine. It's glory, in fact, more than compensates for any difficulties, any hardships, any insults, any persecutions, any sideways glances. The glorious lopsided compensation I will review with you very briefly. First in verse 24, the hard part. Truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, the glorious compensation is it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves this life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Glorious compensation. Whoever serves me must follow me and where I am my servant also will be. That first half, where I am my servant will also be. The only other time Jesus ever used that phrase was in John 14 verse 3 where he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you also may be. This is the glorious compensation for serving Him. Where I am, my servant also will be. In the second half, my Father will honor the one who serves me. Isn't heaven enough for you? Isn't that a sufficient enough reward for dying to yourself? For hating your life in this world? For self-sacrificing and being a servant. Remember that the Father always honors those who serve the Son. He will do so for Jesus' sake. And when our kernel of wheat dies, let it die for Jesus' sake. And when we hate our life in this secular, material, humanistic world, we will hate it for Jesus' sake. And when we serve, we will serve for Jesus' sake. Shall we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, our Master and our King, we come before you 
having just bumped into these three astonishing paradoxes, these three astonishing, difficult, hard sayings of yours. But Lord, what we've discovered today in your word is that by divine inspiration, you planted these hard sayings immediately following these Greeks' request, we would like to see Jesus. I am sure that even John, as he penned these words under divine inspiration, didn't understand how they connected there. But they do. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the solution to the question, how can people see Jesus in my life? Thank you for showing us that when the kernel of wheat dies, that great fruitfulness can come. Lord, I praise you for the comfort that that offers to every person here, myself included, who has ever failed at anything, who has ever made a mistake or a host of mistakes consecutively. Thank you, O Lord, that when kernels of wheat die, And we let them die. When we claim you as our king, you have a way of bringing that back to life in a new and glorious and fruitful way. And Lord, in this world where we're so tempted to focus exclusively on this life, to love this life, to milk it for all it's worth, to turn the fun factor up to 10 and just have fun. Lord, you have thrown a cup of cold water on us this morning where you've said we are to hate our secular, material, humanistic life because it can get in the way of finding eternal life. Help us to hear and to understand that second paradox, which may be the most difficult for one for us to hear, for some of us. Lord, I know that you apply your word differently to each of our lives, and for some the first paradox the most difficult, some the second, some the third, to follow you by serving you and serving others. But Lord, we thank you that regardless, all three of these paradoxes come with built-in glorious compensation. And we praise you for that compensation. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on unseen things, fixed on heaven, fixed on Christ, seated in the heavenly places. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.